everybody. So welcome to Art Talks, the first of a series of webinars by Project 88 that will host discussions between artists, writers, curators, and collectors. I'm very pleased to introduce Project Aputnis and Nancy Rajania, who will participate in this webinar, which will reflect on Projecta's ongoing solo, A Body Without Organs, currently on at Project 88. Uh, Projecta is a Bombay-based artist and works effortlessly with several media such as painting, photography, video, and site-specific installations. She has shown extensively since 2001, both nationally and internationally, and this is her second solo with us. Nancy Adajania is a Bombay-based cultural theorist and curator. She has curated and co-curated a number of exhibitions, including the Melli Gobai Retrospective, Don't Ask Me About Color at the National Gallery of Modern Art, Bombay in 2020, the Sudhir Parvardhan Retrospective, Walking Through Soul City, again at National Gallery of Modern Art, Bombay in 2019, <laughs> Counter Canon, Counter Culture, Alternative Histories of Indian Art at the Serendipity Arts Festival, Goa in 2019, and Navjot's retrospective, The Earth's Heart Torn Out at NGMA Bombay in 2018. Nancy has also taught the curatorial practice course at Salzburg International Summer Academy of Fine Arts in 2013 and 14, and has proposed several new theoretical models through her extensive writings on media art, public art, transcultural art, and the Biennale culture from the global south. So before we begin, I just want to ask everybody to mute their microphones and maybe switch off their videos. And we will use the chat box and the comment section in Facebook and here on Zoom for any questions that you may have, which will be addressed at the end of the discussion. Uh, also feel free to post on the chat if you're having any technical difficulties, which we'll start to solve, we'll try to sort out. So over to you, Nancy and Prajakta. Thank you, Shri. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, great. So uh, thank you for hosting us, Shri. And um, Prajakta and I go back uh, a long way. Uh, we've known each other for almost two decades. Uh, we were together at the coach workshop at, uh, in, at Vasan in 2005, where we shared a room. Um, and I was the critic in residence, and I had the privilege of witnessing uh, her first site-specific installation, Curtain, where she playfully pasted a running frill uh, along the dado line of the walls of the factory guest house. With the intervention of the frill, she had transformed the cold, whitewashed walls of the guest house into a sensuous, intimate interior trading solidity for porosity and hardness for permeability. From the very beginning, her work exhibited the signs of a hallucinatory, low-key surrealism. She displaced everyday reality by small, subtle changes, almost imperceptible, until they were suddenly there. As we all know, Prajikta's current show, A Body Without Organs, at Project 88, open just before the lockdown. I've titled today's conversation, Premonition of a, Con of a Contagion, because this show is deeply uncanny. It presents a dark foreboding of how the body has been rendered vulnerable by the toxic circulations of late capitalism. It also gives us the opportunity to think about the somatic and ecological implications of our self-poisoned environments. It invites us into the slow dance between the processes of imminence, that which is indwelling, inherent, intrinsic, and imminence, that which is on the verge of happening, disclosing afflictions brewing within the body and the world as they erupt. This quietude was and continues to be the ground note of Prajakta's practice. There's always the fear and anticipation of something imminent or impending. It could be an indication of fungus or bacteria or toxic clouds. A seemingly planed down surface holds down the discontents that seem to bubble beneath. From the very beginning of our practice, we find objects floating like chimeras in our paintings, unmoored, unmoored from their proper context in the everyday, yet claiming a Kutudin experience, appearance. This unpredictable interplay between routine and 
and incongruity that defines Projecta's relationship to the world has always been something very fascinating and something worth scrutinizing further. In the catalog essay for a second show in 2008, where she presented sculptures of mundane objects like taps and bulbs and spatulas covered with fake pearls, I wrote what might be true of most of her work to date. All the world's a skin for Projecta, a skin that could be the body's wall against the world, threatened by sudden inflammation or the epidermis of a room flaking by degrees and punctured to let hidden electricity spark through. And then there is the skin of delicate conception that turns into the carapace of an apparatus and is subverted by the imperceptible challenges of pearl-like fungus and fizzy bacteria. Witness the hard edges of everyday tools and objects that get mossed over by irrepressible, uncontrollable growths in Portness's accounts of a process of decay that is also a strange new beginning. Projecta's preoccupation with the body as a wall that can be breached and broken into by foreign elements fungus, bacteria, pollutants of all kinds, continues into the current series as well. Its ultimate origins lies in, I would speculate, in the anxieties of the Bombay middle class, anxieties about living in claustrophobic spaces, the quintessential one BHK, the fear of cracks, seepage, moisture, pollution. This has become more politically nuanced over the years as she reflects on the force field of dread and uncertainty generated by the superpower antagonisms of the Cold War, as well as the urgent issues of climate change and the dread of contagion. During the opening of A Body Without Organs, a friend remarked on the lack of human presence in her works. The everyday objects in her work are accretions of a human presence that is always threatened with a known or unknown trauma. However, Prajakta has never painted in the human figure. Except in college assignments, her art is indicative, never illustrative of a particular theme, social or political. The still life has been the working proposition of her paintings and installations from the very beginning. I wrote in my essay on her first solo in 2006 that even when she focuses on interiors and landscapes which simmer with a coal fire, she treats them as if they were a still life, by which I do not mean a genre. Rather, in my reading, the still life is a condition that affects all other genres, since it dramatizes a particularly subtle in a particularly subtle manner, the contest or the tension between the life force and the fact of mortality. Uh, I believe there's a message from Prajakta about, uh, the, about not appearing on the screen. Uh, Shri, is there something that- No, no I, I'm here, I'm here. Ah, I just oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. sorry. Sorry, because yeah. you know, the WhatsApp keeps pinging, that's why. No. Uh, in her earlier still lives, um, an oniric composition of fruits decaying gradually invoked the presence of fibroids growing in her mother's uterus. In the current show, the presence of detergent in her uncle's lungs becomes the starting point for a reflection on toxic environments by exposing found objects on X-ray film. The still lives on X-ray films are also landscapes. Is that lung a steel wool kitchen scrubber or a nest? Are these white spots seeds? Are these white spots seeds in the lung or are they spots marking tumors? Is the plant growing in the lung a freak accident or has nature taken over the human body and are the X-ray works funerary songs, dirges on the end of the human race? The paintings, almost drawings, constitute interiors stamped with a specific time code. It says 11.24 p.m., 2.13 a.m., but you can't tell the time or location in these works. The still life and the landscape collude to create mountains on a study table or turn a room into a desolate landscape with no road signs. 
a lone bag marooned among what might be the dunes of a desert or the waves of a sea feels like a fossil. And in that gesture, our grasp over genre and space fades. Is this a domestic interior or a landscape or a seascape or is it an expanded still life? All its kinetic energy brought to a halt, frozen in a semblance, in a semblance of what was once alive with movement. Walking into Projecta's current show is like traveling with the artist stroke stalker through a deserted zone. I'm alluding here to Tarkovsky's stalker, of course. The paintings of interiors in the show are contaminated spectral wastelands, and the stalker's promise of the room where all our dreams will come true remains a promise, albeit an unfulfilled one. Projecta's works are to adapt Tarkovsky's phrase, sculpted in time. Time is as much a medium and material in her work as pigment, photography, and the video image. The other day when we were speaking, Projecta mentioned Ozu, the Japanese filmmaker of post-war classics, her affinity for his domestic interiors and unhurried pace. Ozu was known for his still frames, not static ones, mind you, charged with affect and intensification of time and emotion. We can see why this would appeal to Projecta. Ozu had a very different spin on the tenor of the dramatic in cinema. By a few signs, gestures, he was able to exhibit the tremor of emotion. He said, and I quote, a lot of people now equate drama with sensational incident, such as someone getting killed. But that's not drama, it's a freak occurrence. Instead, I think drama is something without sensational incident, something you can't easily put into words, with the characters saying everyday things like, is that right? Yes, it is. So that's what happened. Projecta would concur. I would argue that like Ozu, Projecta's is an art of renunciation. Her paintings and photographs are never melodramatic. They are unemphatically emphatic. They often renounce color. They believe in a stillness disturbed by the slightest tremolo, a tremble or a wavering effect you know, in a musical instrument such as a violin which is produced by a rapid reiteration of a note. Like Ozu's characters, viewers in Projecta's show might ask, is that right? So that's what happened? The works are about everyday life, except that they are not. Looking at the X-ray film works on the embattled lung, on the late motif of the embattled lung, uh, I was suddenly reminded of Kumar Gandharva's rendition of a Nirguni Bhajan by Kabir, Jini Jini Chaddarya. In, in the extraordinary later phase of his career as a vocalist, Kumarji sang with just one lung. The other had been lost to tuberculosis. He adapted his st style around this weakness and made it his strength. A style of singing characterized by inspired bursts episodic yet never staccato, and yet, and as well as an alternation of cloud-touching moments and brief raptures. In that same spirit, Projecta shows us how she can craft from the body's vulnerability, images that are resilient and exercise an, an enduring spell upon us. With these few observations, I'd like to invite Projecta to share her works from our current show. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, that was such a beautiful, long uh, uh, you know, observation from so many years. It's always been a pleasure to uh, share work with you uh, ever since 2006, actually. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen and... Uh, Uh, can you see? Uh, no, I can't. Oh, okay. Let's 
Sabiha, is there something that you can help with or share the PPT? Yeah, no, I can. Yeah. Great. So, uh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, it's always been a pleasure. And uh, thank you, Shri, and the entire team of Project 88. It's not, it's not easy to have an exhibition up and running um, in the middle of a pandemic to top it uh, torrential Mumbai rains and a lockdown. So uh, thank you. Uh, you guys have been amazing. Uh, so ever since the exhibition opened uh, at Project 88, just as the beginning of the outbreak, um, I, uh, I, I still can't uh, believe and I keep wondering how the works that were conceived over a period of last couple of years have a strange resonance to the present moment. Um, as I began conceiving the works for the show around late 2018, I was quite certain that post uh, the 2016 uh, photographic series resembling the imaginary apocalyptic uh, landscapes made from everyday domestic objects dealing with toxicity within the domestic, I wanted to address the fragility of the human body. Also, what made me commit to the idea of this was this particular incident within the family, uh, where a close relative, one of the oldest uncles, suffered from a breathing problem. The diagnosis was a respiratory infection caused by some chemical particles present within his lung act cavity. My uncle had worked all his life in a soap detergent factory. These chemicals, benign all these years, all his working life, suddenly spewed one fine day, making it difficult for him to breathe. It made me think of the body of a worker, of how vulnerable it was how easily it was exploited. I wanted to dig deeper into the nexus between the frailty of the human body and the greed of a capitalist state. The complete disregard that is for the workforce of this country was clearly even evident most recently when an unannounced lockdown made thousands of helpless laborers to come to the streets. Once the general premise for the show was set, um, I, I, I kind of started closing down on different mediums. Um, I was quite certain that uh, I wanted to use painting as a medium. I also wanted to test and see if the medium of painting was able to embody the ethos of an overburdened body of a worker. The decision of uh, using x-rays came in as I was rummaging through my uncle's numerous chest x-rays. I've been fascinated with old technologies to be with films or, uh, you know, the film slides or x-ray films, which require uh, a process uh, quite similar to exposing a film. So, So I've been fascinated with these old technologies. Uh, and I think the medium of film itself in terms of how it gets processed is, is super interesting. Um, so what you see here is actually an X-ray, uh, which is quite at the entrance. This is the first image that you kind of see um, as you enter the space along with a video installation. And uh, this is a, the, the medium is actually x-ray film, uh, which uh, has, uh, which is kind of displayed in a light box. Uh, yeah. So the, I've been, yeah, I mean, to create a radiograph, uh, a patient is positioned uh, underneath this, x-ray machine and uh, you know the x-ray uh, kind of passes through the uh, through the body and through various tissues uh, when the machine is turned on uh, the x-ray uh, sorry i think i'm misreading what i've written but 
yeah um so so it's very interesting how different kind of uh, radioactive uh, you know uh, rays pass through different tissues of an object uh, creating uh, uh, or or almost creating this image uh, most radiologists are uh, using digital medium for taking x-rays it's much faster but i was told that some old school doctors uh, still rely on the old technique or, or the precision that's because of uh, you know this old technique of making x-rays uh, so the technique is quite uh, interesting you basically uh, have a, a film which is an unexposed film Uh, so once these rays are passed the film is taken into a dark room and uh, kind of dipped into these various solutions and uh, then let for washing and then drying and then the image kind of reveals itself um, what's interesting is that there's this whole process of anticipation of this image that um, you're not sure and certain of what you're going to see um Were you also looking at uh, Mohalinaj and Manray's uh, photograms or cameraless cameraless uh, photographs? I mean, I one kind of breathes these, no? These things that one has learned in history, and obviously, when uh, you're choosing your material, it's quite uh, an immediate kind of need to choose the medium. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, for for sure, all these references kind of uh, come within the work. in the and and also I, i couldn't anticipate how these visuals were going to look like even the doctors that and the technicians that i was uh, working with uh, were not sure how a, a steel wool is going to kind of appear um, on on a film because they'd never done that so they they also have to use different exposure levels to kind of make things visible um but yeah um uh, this was uh, this is also a painting which is kind of at the entrance of the exhibition space and uh, so the process of painting for me was quite similar to the process of uh, speaking to uh, uh, you know how how a criminal uh, artist uh, a sketch artist would kind of approach uh, a sketch uh, he would listen and he would kind of draw from someone else's memory uh so what i did was i would go and visit my uncle with his with this sketchbook and i would kind of draw from his memory of how his workspace was uh but i was also probably trying to think what what are, what are the possibilities of painting what can painting actually do can it uh kind of embody and can can it also expose certain notions and feelings that are difficult to narrate and and express um can it carry that um that feeling that's interesting because uh, on the one hand these are diagnostic images yeah. where uh, you are reading the signs of your uncle's illness and the space uh, that he inhabited once upon yeah. a time yeah. and on the other hand these are also prognostic images because yeah. they are talking about what is to come yeah. and that is why you have these toxic clouds yeah uh, in the, in yeah. the work yeah yeah i mean he would keep saying that he would have the strange smell that he would uh, you know uh, encounter as soon as he entered the premise and and of course the exhibition for me was not about just this one uh, member from my family i was also trying to think and imagine what it was for uh, people working in toxic spaces and what does it do to the body um and all these are imperceptible uh, elements no uh, in a way yeah it's it's yeah. affect which uh, yeah which you can't really sort of render in some illustrative manner yeah this again is a uh, is actually steel wool and glass beads which are kind of uh, placed underneath the x-ray uh, machine and then kind of uh, let things happen so there's some really interesting funny surprises that uh, kind of happen within the work so this white dot that you see right at the corner on the right hand lower right hand side 
um, is actually uh, an ant. So uh, we didn't notice this uh, when we were kind of when I was. So what I do was I would go and I would place my or make my arrangements onto this small tray, uh, and then uh, let uh, you know let the technician take the X-ray. So we both didn't realize that there was an ant which was present. So she's kind of, she's come in a couple of x-rays and only when, uh, yeah, only when we kind of exposed it, we realized that uh, this, this is an x-ray of an ant. It's probably just passing by. So this flickering uh, thing within the uh, X-ray is obviously not so much visible as you, uh, you know, as you see the work. Uh, it's also something that's happened uh, because of the camera uh, while recording, um, which is also beautiful because it creates this uh, feeling of uh, a television screen almost. So this particular one is. Uh, they're different materials. So I, I would also just uh, collect things uh, on the way. Uh, so this was a, a coconut branch and there's some steel wool, uh, which is kind of placed. So there's some really funny things that happened during the, uh, because I would visit, first of all, it was very difficult to find one x-ray clinic, which was willing to do this old uh, method of taking x-rays. Everybody is doing digital right now. Mm -hmm. So somehow managed to find this one uh, uh, one place in Gorega, which and they would allow me to come and do uh, and take x-rays. And uh, it was very funny. So between like these two, three patients, I would wait. And then so, you know, this technician would probably go through the process of taking an x-ray of someone who's broken his hand or fractured. And then here I'm carrying these strange um, weird objects uh, so the patients would like look at it and you know wonder what it is and uh, and after a few years I mean it was almost like how huh, it's an artist who's working so no more you know you just say it's an art project and then people don't ask too many questions I don't know whose sound is this. Is that yours? Or I think somebody's no. yeah. by mistake kept their audio on, I think. So uh, this was the display in a way. I mean, uh, with the, like these images of painting, uh, which kind of are, uh, you know, almost uh, interspersed with these light images, uh, light boxes of x-rays. Yes. Yeah. But also the contrast between uh, these paintings, which are almost like drawings. Yeah. Uh, you know, these these are evanescent. They're almost disappearing. Yeah. They are done, you know, with very faint lines. Yeah. And then you have the X-ray uh, boxes, yeah. the X-ray film boxes, which are extremely spectral. Yeah. So yeah. I think also in in yeah. terms of uh, you know. In, in terms of the way time moves between yeah. these yeah. two objects. Yeah. So uh, in terms of the affect that you actually get as you are actually yeah. moving, oscillating between these two very different mediums, yeah. Yeah. two very different kinds of also um, uh, emotional temperatures. Yeah, yeah. True. I think it was also the surfaces in a way that is like this really dense painted surface on paper with uh, like densely painted they're almost like eight to nine coats of paint that go on to the paper uh, and then you have this uh, screen which is almost like an illuminated screen so uh, i mean as as one is conceiving uh, works and images i think there was also the sense of uh, almost like a, a deadness of the wall uh, or or a space or or a void and then these uh, illuminated images. But I think also the display in a way, I mean, if I can go back, I think, I think the display uh, uh, was also quite, quite properly curated. And I think uh, towards the end, it was Justin who kind of uh, curated the, the kind of the emotional part of uh, experiencing these works. Um,
Yeah. So there were certain details of how and which ones kind of play with each other was, I think that that also adds to the the the, the affect and the the lyrical uh, part of experiencing a work. Mm. So this one's titled 11.23 p.m. And that's something that I keep doing. I kind of, mm. um, I, I title the works uh, with different moments and different time. It's also a way of pinning down time. It's also a way of uh, probably imagining if, if, is it the time of the painting? Is it the time that's depicted within the painting? Or is it the time the painting was completed or started and, and I like to kind of uh, keep it uh, ambiguous in that sense. But yeah, but I think I wanted the paintings to kind of uh, be pinned to a certain moment. So here is obviously this uh, image of the X-ray, uh, which also is kind of transforming into a window. But yeah, I was thinking of rest and disease and, um, and sickness, uh, I think, when making... So these were balloons, actually, balloons uh, filled with water and kind of placed underneath the X-ray. Mm. But they also look like eye diagrams, or yeah, yeah, and like yeah. I was thinking of these really cancerous growth mm. or fibroids again, and uh, yeah. So whenever, I mean, there were some stories from uh, from my uncle's end where he would, you know, or, or images that I had of his, of mm. someone coming and after work probably, you know, removing your clothes and, you know, your shirt and probably uh, leaving it behind uh, uh, a door. Mm. And this whole thing of the sweat, the sweat of labor in, in mm. that sense, the smell of labor. Mm. Um, hanging there behind that door uh, i think that's something that is what i was probably imagining and thinking so the title of this work is 6 45 pm so like evening time i mean memories of my dad also coming back from work and mm. you know, this thing of leaving your shirt on the door Yeah, the bread and the wallet. I mean, it was also my uh, way of probably mm. painting, like, you know, going back to college and painting a, a still life object. Uh, mm. But yeah, the, for me, they carry obviously different uh, meanings of livelihood, of, mm. uh, of work, of labor. And that green is like, of course, quite different from the rest of the work. The green is almost this stamp paper, green paper that you usually have your, uh, you know, formal documents printed or typed on. Yeah, this one's titled 2.12 p.m. Mm. Then this whole feeling of, um, so I think it's almost like a psychological uh, portrait in that sense. So for, for a room being filled with water and uh, someone feeling like they're being drowned or something like that. But there are things that happen with a painting, which, I mean, I've gone back to painting almost after four years now, uh, three, four years. Yeah, I, I kind of, I do not have a very regular studio practice, but I, I mean, I obviously sketch sometimes, and, but I do not have a very regular studio practice. And I think I like to go back to that stage of feeling like I don't know how to paint and kind of restart from, um, 
looking at the paper and feeling uh, anxious. So uh, in this particular work, I think I kind of knew most parts and I knew how I wanted to kind of fill the space and all. But I think the only point for uh, where I felt that the work kind of landed itself was this one briefcase, which is on the left hand side of the paperwork. Uh, it's, it's almost, I think that situated the work for me, that made it complete. This was the first work I actually started uh, working on. It's titled 3.53 AM. Another beautiful space of Project 80, I think. Yes. It's just, so, um, Along, so I was also sure that uh, between these elements of paper and uh, film, there was going to be this one kind of a ticking uh, element within the show, which I was quite certain of. And uh, yeah, this is one more work. Uh, again, uh, images of uh, of of you know, him explaining how his work desk was and uh, how usually there is, you know, when, when things kind of dust gathers or hair gathers and there's this small tornado-like thing that happens at the corner of a room. Um, this is actually, yeah, something uh, like that. There's something brewing at the corner of the room. It's titled 110 p.m. Yeah, this is again steel wool uh, put together, made it look like some kind of uh, bodily uh, organ. Yeah, the soap. This is this is the thing I was speaking about. So, like, I wanted the show to have a ticking element in it, and um, the, uh, there was this image of a soap uh, which had these uh, drops of water falling on them. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the drops of water uh, that kind of uh, kind of fall on the on the soap every few seconds, um, and it's almost like uh, towards the end, uh, you know, you'd have this really melted soap. But it's also like uh, Chinese torture practices, yeah. where you just have this drop of water yeah. falling on the prisoner's head. Yeah, I think. The, the, this, this, this works not only in terms of, of course, uh, your uncle's memory, yeah. uh, you know, being contaminated by yeah. his detergent, but yeah. also uh, it, this is almost like, uh, uh, it's, it's like a slow death. Yeah, yeah. The, the soap melting slowly and in, yeah. in a way, almost as yeah. if you know, we're witnessing a death in, yeah. within the gallery. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a way of kind of um, almost having a live element or or, or or something alive within the gallery, which would kind of disintegrate towards the end of the show. Uh, and few things that were not planned for, like these these uh, beautiful drops that kind of uh, happen around the soap, was quite uh, the splash. Yeah. 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 And from there, one kind of moves into a more, uh, I would say, the belly of the gallery, like really into a kind of a corner of the gallery uh, or, or the center of the gallery. Uh, and from the soap, so when you're also kind of moving a little ahead, you see this slide projector, which has actually 81 slides, uh, which are actually uh, you know, images of 
foam in a sink. Uh, and so for me, I think this whole context also of the soap and the foam um, and the sense of toxicity. So I think the, it's almost like there's a bit of, within my mind, it was almost like there's an element of toxicity that kind of builds within this space of the gallery. So there are about 81 slides of uh, the sink image along with these two wall drawings, which I call them as toxic drawings. Uh, so the drawings done of two sides of the, I mean, two lungs on two sides of the walls, and then they're kind of covered with uh, these foam sheets. Uh, so you're supposed to kind of view these works uh, through the foam sheets. Yeah. This is almost, uh, you're coming back towards the entrance of the gallery. And then there's this projection, uh, which is a video projection um, of actually uh, these uh, uh, fire burners, these gas burners. So I was quite, uh, I mean, interested in these abstract elements within the show as well. Uh, this, this particular video of the um, of the gas flame was actually uh, done earlier. Uh, it was shown at the Sharjah Foundation, it was part of a curated exhibition, and uh, but it was viewed quite differently. The, it was viewed on a table, and uh, here. Uh, it's almost like uh, you know you're facing it, and for me they almost become like these two eyes uh, that are looking back at the viewer, and I think uh, uh, that's what uh, that's how you either enter or exit the exhibition of of these two eyes looking back at you. Um, so when it's horizontal, yeah, uh, uh, like in the Sharjah hot plates work, then yeah. they remind you of archetypal fire yeah but uh, when it's vertical it becomes yeah. like a surveillance regime absolutely yeah so yeah. i think also perhaps you could talk a little bit about site specificity you know beginning with your the yeah. coach workshop yeah. and first tried your hand yeah. at uh, expanding your uh, practice of painting yeah yeah um yeah i i think i'll share the images and uh, and kind of It's lovely to hear the train sound, uh, Nancy. Yeah, it's very rhythmic. We can, yeah. It reminds you of a Satyajit Ray film. Completely. <laughs> what yeah. Where is the PPT? It's not visible? Okay. I know. <laughs> so sorry. Yeah, it is visible now. Yeah, yeah, this is the work we were speaking of, the coach work of, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think it was early in, in third year in college, uh, you know, I was completely fascinated with uh, site-specific works and um, it almost kind of opened up the, uh, you know, like the space for oneself in a way where you felt like you didn't have to depend on a studio or you didn't have to depend on a gallery or anything like that. You could just make work anywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, the coach uh, residency almost uh, gave that opportunity. Uh, so this is actually, uh, it was actually a painting. And then I thought, uh, and I remember discussing with you then in 2000, mm -hmm. saying maybe I should make this into a real 
physical space and see if it works and you're like, yeah, yeah, you should. So <laughs> it, uh, yeah, it, it was good to, I think, actually also imagine how a painting can, be, can, can kind of um, come alive and, and almost become a, a takeover of physical space. So this was at Zakenta National Gallery of Art, Warsaw in 2011. I showed it again. Yeah. But also you play with scale. Yeah. And, so, you and know, you are, you are stitching up uh, the interiors of a wall, yeah. uh, which, which is just perhaps a small room, or yeah. you are stitching up the, the, the walls of a, you know, of, of a biennial site, like the yeah. Wangchu Biennial. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was also a way of breaking free uh, in a way. By, I mean, I think uh, as an artist who's also working with really limited uh, resources in that sense, you know, we all have these really tiny 1BHK spaces in Bombay as workspaces. Uh, how do you still manage to kind of make work um, which, you know, where you don't worry about scale in that sense? And um, I think I think site-specific uh, installation kind of... Um, allows one to do that. And I think the similar case with also the photographic works, they kind of uh, allow you to inhabit a really tiny space like the refrigerator and then kind of stage things in it and then take pictures. So uh, I think working with scale was also a way of, uh, it's come because of certain limitations within my own uh, you know, conditions of, of work and so this was at Wolfsburg Museum, 2018, and uh, this was the most uh, massive wall I've ever worked with, you know, almost 40 feet high, and, um, and the material is thread, thread and needles that are put together. Uh, I'll just go back to the photographic works again. I and mean, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, the whole idea of staging and, and what you said about uh, theater also comes from these, uh, you know, from, from as a kid uh, going and watching a lot of Marathi plays. And uh, so instead of the narratives, which used to be about uh, domesticity and, and you, you know, like human relationships, I would be interested in how it was all kind of put together or kind of uh, placed on this one um, stage, the, the proscenium in that sense. And... Uh, I'd look at how the windows were made and things like that. So uh, I think staging and still life in a way are uh, uh, something that I've kind of always interested in. And also, uh, when you witnessed uh, the Marathi Natak tradition, which yeah. was at uh, this Gadkari Rangayatan uh, yeah. in, 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 in Thani, yeah. uh, there it was, it was it, it's a form of bourgeois theater. Yeah. So in bourgeois theater, you know, the there's always the fourth wall. Yeah, the fourth absolutely. wall is the fiction. That's yeah. us, public. Yeah. You yeah. know, who are witnessing uh, this play, and mm -hmm. and again, I like the idea that you know, I mean, in your work also, I think you're playing with this fourth wall, the illusion yeah. of the fourth wall. Yeah. And, you know, whether it's in your refrigerator series or it's in your paintings. Yeah. So these again, I mean, these were escalator models made and. I was fascinated by the inside of the refrigerator and most domestic spaces. I think they're, they're absolutely uh, crazy as you zoom in. Uh, this was shown at the Bhaudaji Lad Museum. That's a painting, I think, titled Landscape. I mean, I think I, I placed this work also in a way to kind of show the transition from the painting to to a site-specific immersive installation for me. This was shown at the Kadis Tat Foundation in uh, 2013, and I was there for two months. And um, so this, the title of the work is Room Full of Rooms, and uh, I wanted to look at the city through other people's uh, views and what they saw out of their homes. Um, it was also the time when people were speaking of migrants coming in in Bombay or, you know, uh, and, and not carrying their culture, you know, also this whole concept of integration and how you should carry your own uh, histories with you or, or culture with you. So, so this particular work, I think, is also kind of interesting to me in that sense where uh, the different parts of every, like different people's homes that, is, that, that 
kind of have been put together. So there's the ceiling of um, a, a French uh, woman's house, and then the window is actually a Tunisian man's window. Um, the door that you see, the tiny door on the left hand side, the projection is actually a, a sorry, a projection from a Sri Lankan household. Uh, so, so there's just these different parts that, uh, yeah, that that are put together, and there are also these laces from, say, Crawford Market and and this old market, Santua Market in Paris, and they kind of uh, put together, stitched together, and speak of this whole idea of integration, question it as well. So it's a transcultural interior. Yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah, I mean, you, you're taking the, the genre of the, the Dutch interior, yeah. uh, working with um, the, the quality of light, of yeah. course, because yeah. the property of light is what actually makes the Dutch interior when you're looking at a Vermeer painting, for instance. True, true. And you are able to bring in that luminosity again with an analog technology like the slide projector. Yeah, yeah, true. Which not only creates this uh, effulgence yeah. and yeah. luminosity, but also keeps time. With this yeah. metronome-like, uh, yeah. you know, sound yeah. absolutely of the slide projector moving. Yeah, I, I think that this is, you know, again, a very, very intriguing work, and and also things that perhaps you can't do through your painting, you are yeah. able to do site specifically here. Yeah, and and yeah. and in a way, actually, again, you know, create holes in the wall, turn yeah. the wall into a skin. True. True. Yeah, I mean, the, I, I came, I stumbled upon the uh, slide projector also by, I mean, the, the whole idea initially was to capture light. I was, I was hoping if I could kind of capture light from one house and then place it somewhere else. Is it possible to do that? And the only way to do it was, I thought, uh, the slide projectors, because they work with, um, with, with the element of light and uh, the film uh, almost making it uh, feel like uh, it's a part of somewhere which is kind of um, traveled and uh, come into this gallery space. And also bringing all these different fragments of interiors yeah. that again creates, uh, it, it, it in a way just uh, sort of breaks open the genre of the interior, the Eurocentric, uh, Eurocentric interior yeah, and uh, injects it with, uh, you know, other kinds of light, air, smells, yeah. You have lace, you know, yeah. so again, um, haptic surfaces. Yeah. But yeah. again, it's something that's done, you know, in a very controlled manner. There, there isn't any melodrama or shouting. Yeah. It's, and, and I think that that's something that, uh, you know, uh, has always drawn me towards your work. This was actually shown at uh, Project 88 2016 solo and... Um, yeah, I mean, I think this whole body of work was also uh, after Berlin, after that one year residency in Berlin and looking at, uh, you know, you, you were hearing so many things of um, the seed wall being made in Norway and, uh, you know, the, the people trying to, you know, plan trips to Mars and things. So you actually felt, is the world really ending in that sense? And I think these, these works kind of um, resonate. This is lovely. That. This is almost like space mobiles, you know. <laughs> yeah, they're actually your blender. Uh, I know, the mixy. Blades, the yes. mixy blades yeah. found from uh, this uh, station road in Goregao East. <laughs> you have to be very specific, don't you? <laughs> and you should. Yeah. Uh, this was actually the, one of the last major projects which happened uh, at the Sharjah Foundation and it's called Hot Plate and it's actually a continuation from the earlier work uh, which was called Kitchen Debate. And uh, so the, these are like interactive video tables which are almost like your hot plate tables which you can and with knobs which you can turn on. So you turn on and then you have these different videos playing. Um, I wouldn't, I'm not sure how we're doing with time. I wouldn't go into the details of it but uh, maybe end with this one particular, uh, so this was the night vision work, which was also part um, uh, initially shown there. And you have these two elements of the fire, the real fire and these, um, yeah. 
So I want to share this particular work. So I was on one of the terraces in Bombay, uh, in Bandra, and uh, we were having this one meeting and, uh, uh, and I just got drawn into these, uh, you know, this direction where there were these two crows who were kind of nibbling on, uh, on a takeaway menu card. And this was not too far away from me. This was almost like, say, seven feet away from where we were sitting. And uh, they were like intently on it for almost 10, 15 minutes. And I kind of patiently waited for them to kind of just leave the, uh, leave the takeaway menu card. And, uh, and then what I found was quite amazing. I actually found, uh, sorry, I actually found, oops. I actually found uh, their self-portrait on onto the takeaway menu card. They, they made a self-portrait for sure. Well, uh, we were just having some fun, uh, I think, uh, day before yesterday. And I said, uh, you know, Prajakta, this whole thing is, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's fiction, you know. And, uh, and of course, it, it, it could be fiction or it isn't, but that's not really the point. I think what's really fascinating about this work, which you have called collaboration, yeah. uh, is that uh, you can't read it in any one way. Uh, yeah. Is this a collaboration? Um, you know, uh, is this pointing towards a kind of, uh, in, in, you know, interdependence, uh, you know, uh, in, in, uh, in nature, where, you know, which, which is something that humans can actually learn from, since we are always so agonistic and we could learn from, you know, the bird world or the animal world? Or is this actually antagonism, where you have these crows having a go at the menu card? And again, are they pecking into their own cutouts, the bird cutouts, or, uh, you know, I mean, is this something that they've actually made through, their, through the process of pecking? Yeah. Of course, we, we don't know. And I think that that's what actually turns this into such a significant parable, even for our times. The yeah. fact that you cannot interpret either artwork or reality only in a single, only through a single perspective. And in our fascist times, I think that's something that's very important to remember. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was also like just the uh, process of making art is also uh, so strange. No, I mean you also have to just be present uh, mm. within a moment uh, to be able to kind of uh, hold on to that moment and make make it happen into art. So uh, for me, it's also uh, also that alertness. Yeah. Yeah sense of dhyana, focus. Yeah. yeah. But also the work is just open to criticality. I mean, you know, it, it, it allows for different interpretations. Yeah. And I think that perhaps that's also one of the reasons why it's, it's best to end on this work. Yeah. And um, I think we perhaps need to just check the, the chat box in case there are any uh, questions. So um, this, this is from Mithu Sen to everyone, one of the most brilliant artists of our times. Thank oh. you for this talk. Sadly, I have to leave or leave because of a prior commitment. I'm just checking if there is any question answer. Um, okay, so she has thanked us and uh, we thank her back. Thank you for patiently being there for us and listening in, yeah. Mithu. And... Um, as we wait for other questions to come in, perhaps, what we could also do, uh, Prajakta, is that maybe I could ask you another question, which is, uh, what's the difference in terms of your process when you're making a painting yeah. versus when you are making uh, your photographs, especially yeah. the ones where you're staging photographs in the refrigerator? Yeah. Well, I, th I mean, that's what I think. It's almost like work happens in different phases. It's like, I think painting almost requires one to be in a particular mental space um, and it's a it's a solitude space it's a space where you're uh, kind of isolated and you're kind of on your own um, which is which is a part of me and absolutely crucial but then there's this other element of 
uh, of also kind of collaborating in that sense and making different energies kind of uh, happen, uh, which is, I think, what photographic works allow. But there's also the sense of immediacy, which I think a photographic work uh, allows one to have of staging, of taking pictures and uh, not fearing that they're going to, you know, work or not work. Whereas in a, in a painting, there's a lot of pressure of not uh, wasting or, 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 you know, spoiling the image or so. So the, the, the sense of immediacy, I think I feel, um, I feel far more with, uh, uh, with either the sketches or the sketchbooks or, uh, or with photographic works. So also photographic works, um, one has to kind of get in a few things. I mean, I hardly work on post in most of these uh, works. There's hardly any Photoshop that kind of majorly goes. Uh, it's, uh, but I need lights. I need certain, uh, you know, things like uh, I, I need lights. So I have to hire a light person for, for, for kind of photographing. Um, so, yeah, so, so, yeah, they're just two mental, uh, one has to be in two different mental So spaces. just to add, uh, I, I think, um, you know, one day when I was talking to you and you had told me that painting is actually like uh, doing kheti, uh, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> agricultural work. So, I mean, it, that just came back to me, you know, I mean, the hard work that you put into yeah. it and yeah. also the time that you invest in it, you know, because it yeah. grows slowly. You're not just finishing yeah. it in one day. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you're, then you're looking at the harvest and you're checking whether the, the monsoon was right or or not or you know I mean Absolutely. has the crop been destroyed <laughs> so while the photograph I mean once you've set your stage you take the photograph and then you choose from the many variations that you have yeah. so uh, I think there is um, an observation from Sanjay Matre uh, or there's a question in fact how do how do men how do you mentally resolve questions of time memory and sensorial history so poignant in this series mm -hmm. That's in, in, the, in the show, okay. In the um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's kind of, I mean, I think I, I would go back, um, I would, uh, I would go to my uncle with a, it's almost like a journalistic approach of, of listening and, and, you know, uh, not having your own opinions much about it. Um, and, and it's almost like taking down as many notes as one can from someone else's memory. Uh, and then there is this whole process of filtering it and, and kind of making it work within, um, within different mediums. Uh, I don't know how, how one really works with it. It's, it's also quite intuitional in a way, uh, one, uh, and, and in, and in terms of, uh, so, so, so the notes were kind of there somewhere. There were also like sketches which were made from the notes. Um, but there was also this whole intuitional element within the making that also allows you to kind of just um, take certain liberties and, and work on images. And So, um, Portnis, do you want to hear from Bhagwati Prasad? Uh, he says, Aapka kaam bohat achcha hai, ek adbut viranta. Or kya ye Bombay se aara hai? Haan, haan ji, ye Bombay se broadcast ho hai. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but we also have a question from Bose, which is not showing up on the chat because it's somehow oh. come privately. He mm -hmm. asks, um, it would be good to know your time at FTI Pune since there were mm. reference to Tarkovsky and Oh, Ovo. yes. Oh, I owe it to Bose for that completely. Um, it was Bose actually who suggested uh, just after college that, uh, you know, I mean, we're all kind of uh, in that zone where you're trying to wonder, okay, now, you know, after masters, what do you do? Where do you, you know, start? And, and it was Bose who actually suggested that, uh, you know, we should, uh, some of us and uh, I, I, some of us should go to FTI. And uh, I don't think anyone else came with me, but I was the only one who kind of managed to convince my parents that, no, no, this was absolutely important for me. Um, but it was a wonderful time uh, to be exposed to world cinema and uh, uh, and at that time it was like you know there were just these uh, batch of say 20 25 people who were like just breathing and eating and consuming films and um, and it came in at a very crucial moment for me I think it came when when also my language was being formed and 
um, of course, uh, yeah, I mean, from Godard to Tarkovsky to it, yeah, it absolutely inculcated some really uh, good, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, when I was at FTII, um, uh, I was studying film editing there, but for the FA course, uh, who do you think was there? Sonia oh, Kurana, Shaina oh, Anand. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a must, I think I would suggest that. I mean, of course, now with this whole situation, uh, the, 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 uh, the way FTI has uh, gone through, uh, yeah. it's quite sad, uh, but yeah, around the, around early 2000s, it was just absolutely a fertile, beautiful place. The wisdom tree to be under it, uh, to be exposed to Ritay Katak, to yeah, Ray, and it was quite, quite amazing. And thanks, Bose, for that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have, you know, coming from Thane, there was no way to be uh, kind of uh, but also the other good thing was in Bombay, we had these film festivals, which yes. one would go to and yeah. Thanks to people like Amrit Gangar. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Screen Unit. But also I think Bose has been a very important catalyst figure for, uh, uh, for younger artists. Absolutely. Um, whether it's in, 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 you know, initiating them into the world of filmmaking or yeah. whether it's uh, initiating them into the act of reading. Because yeah. I know so many artists who's, on whose work I've written, younger artists, they've told me, oh, it was Bose who actually lent us this book. Bose bought this book for us, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, he, whenever he went abroad on his fellowships, he always brought back books and then yeah. shared them with the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Absolutely. this is before, uh, you know, uh, before the onset of globalization, before yeah, or internet or yeah, yeah, exactly. Google. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that we are all nourished by the generosity yeah. also yeah, of um, our artist friends. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, we have uh, Pallavi Paul who has written a beautiful oh. essay, um, yeah. A Body Without mm -hmm. Organs, yeah. uh, for um, Prajakta's uh, yeah. recent show. And yeah. um, she's congratulated you, Prajakta. Yeah, and, she's a sweetheart. Yeah. And um, she says, questions of time, labor, body were evoked in various ways through this presentation. I'm thinking, how can we imagine this body without organs? Do we see the absence of organs as a hard limit, despair, um, or an opening uh, possibility? Mm -hmm. On a side note, the exhibition has so many images of lungs. Maybe the visitors are the breath drawn and gently released. Oh. That's beautifully put. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Pallavi. I mean, it was amazing how she just, uh, it was also necessary. I think, I mean, uh, we, I, I wanted an artist to kind of respond to the show and uh, again, her generosity of, of, of writing for the show and with her dissertation and all those things she's managed to, yeah, uh, do full justice. And thank you for everyone for being there. All these friends who've managed to uh, stay long and. Yes, yeah, I've just unmuted myself, uh, Prajakta. Uh, yeah. Quickly, I think I'm going to end with what Pallavi's asked and ask you again, because again, sure. seeing the exhibition for so long and you know, looking at it after the pandemic, uh, yeah. do we look at it as something, you know, the absence of bodies, do we look at it as something with despair? Or we do, do we look at it this as an opening or a portal or a possibility? What do you feel? Well, I think uh, with the way the situation is, uh, I do feel that we with our bodies are the only things left uh, in that sense. We can only take ourselves to the streets. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't look at ourselves in despair in that sense. I would look at the body as something, as a collective a uh, form of protest or uh, you know form that can kind of make some some change or some voice uh, be heard uh, around the time when voices are kind of almost muted so uh, i wouldn't want to lose hope uh, at this moment at all and hang on to it and hang on to i mean it was shaheen bag where we saw all these bodies on the streets and uh, you know the bodies of the laborers walking and it, it these are images which are not going to go out of our collective memory so um, yeah it's it, even if they kind of 
distract us from all the weird different news. We're kind of going to hold on with our bodies and be out there. Nancy, any other concluding yeah. points? I mean, I think that, uh, again, uh, you know, I mean, uh, as we were looking at the parable of the crow, uh, I think there are different ways in which we can parse this exhibition. And I think that Pallavi's essay is beautifully written, and she has uh, used uh, uh, Deleuze's idea of the body without organs as a touchstone. And um, I like the way she's argued her uh, position out. But, uh, for, but, but, but for me, uh, you know, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm interpreting Deleuze and his idea of the body without organs, you you're also, uh, you know, it's, it's also hinting actually at the pre-linguistic uh, body, the body full of libidinal energy, which is trying to release itself from, you know, your sociological and historical uh, location and time. And uh, uh, this, this, of course, you know, comes from this whole French context where you're looking also at Foucault or Deleuze, where the body, uh, you know, uh, the body has to be released from, uh, from, from the hegemonic social institutions, from the, from the hegemonic power of the medical institutions. So I think that it, it comes from a particular context. And, um, and of course, we can always pass this exhibition through, through that perspective. But the way I look at it, for me, uh, this is a body very much with organs. And therefore, I also brought in uh, Kumarji. Um, I, I think that, you know, I mean, uh, as I said also in the note to the premonition of a contagion, for me, this is an exhibition which is made out of, you know, the elements of light, fire, water, air, also trauma, reverie. And, 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 and the, the body makes a very insistent presence, uh, and so do its organs. Um, and, uh, and I think that from the very beginning, from the way, from when I've been looking at Prajakta's work, uh, I think that the, the body makes itself very present. And I don't think that uh, it's about releasing, it is about releasing itself, of course, from sociological um, or, you know, technological or biological or other, other kinds of, um, uh, you know, technologies or powers that they, that 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 uh, th that you know the body is actually corralled within, but um, it's it, the, the affect of of what what Prajakta makes is something where the body is insistent. It's it's not um, it's not it's not without organs. It's it's um, it's not just libidinal or pre linguistic or primordial or you know something which which as I as I explained it comes from that particular French context where. But I mean again you know we we can argue about this and debate about it. And um, I, I just want to sort of, um, I mean, uh, Shri, if I just, if I can just take a little moment. Um, Shri? Of course, please yeah. go ahead. Yes, so I, I have uh, something here. And <laughs> Rajakta, do you recognize this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, uh, <laughs> this is a little message bottle that yeah. uh, Rajakta gave me many years ago. <laughs> and it's a message bottle which has these tiny scrolls of paper. And of course, you can write your messages in it. And uh, I think she, you bought it from Korea for me. And, um, and, I, and I've just found this gift so beautiful, even the first time I received it. And right now when we were spring cleaning, uh, that was the time uh, when, uh, you know, I just found this and I fell in love with it all over again. Because oh. here we have, you know, I mean, again, an object, which is yeah. very much like your art. Yeah. It's subtle. And yeah. um, it's also something which is proposing that which is unsayable. Oh, that's sweet. You know? <laughs> so, so thank you for this. Oh, come on. <laughs> It's a surprise. This was like completely... yes. <laughs> well, we have to stage things as well, you know. <laughs> wow. Oh, there's okay. some really amazing friends. Monali is here. It's it's amazing. Yes. All these friends have been around. Thanks, Monali. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Shri. Yes, so thank you everybody for joining us on this Friday evening. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Prajakta, for this very engaging conversation. And since it was our first, I have to say I was a bit <laughs> nervous about all the technical stuff. And a big yeah, thank you to nice. Sabia, who did thank all you. the back end from Project 88. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us and have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.